the aquanaut buddy teams working on the reef swim to one of the nearby gazebos every two hours to let the tech inside the habitat know they're okay. Gazebo, Aquarius, you read us. And to refill their air tanks. They can plug into a, a fill source without taking their gear off their back. The fill whip is built in so they can plug in, open a valve, and their tanks fill. After an average of six hours of working on the reef, the aquanauts return to the habitat for a four-hour break before they go back out for another dive. They enter Aquarius via the wet porch. This is where they store their dive gear and shower before entering the main lock of the habitat. Over here. Yeah, love it. They live in tight quarters, but they have everything they need. Here's our little kitchen, and as you can see, we've got a microwave. Here's our food. We start with pasta, chicken, and so forth. So among our favorite foods are uh, chips. You get them in these vacuum containers, and you can see what happens when you take chips from one atmosphere pressure down to two and a half atmosphere pressures where we're living, it just crushes the can right down. So you get lots more chips, it's just that it's smaller servings. We don't use flames down here, so we have a hot water tap. You don't want to stick your finger in it, it's very hot, absolutely boiling. So we can have oatmeal or anything else, we can make coffee. The divers need to eat a high calorie diet to counteract all the calories they burn diving. They have a little seating area with a large porthole, a bathroom, and several computers, which give them around-the-clock access to their instruments on the reef as well as the outside world. Okay, here's our bunk room. Little workbench right by the wonderful viewport. Throughout the mission, the aquanauts receive continuous support from a team of scientists that make daily dives from the surface. Each night, the aquanauts call the watch desk with their dive plan for the next day. It would be easiest to move off the sponge tomorrow and we talk about doing the sand rubble. It sounds like it's going to be fine and the uh, day boat should be out about 10 to 4 tomorrow. I think we have a plan here. Four days into the mission, the scientists are excited about some of the preliminary data they collected. We hypothesized that we would see much lower pHs right down next to the bottom, simply because of all the local input of CO2 from respiration. And we're seeing that, in fact. Uh, pH drops significantly, probably about a 2% uh, lower pH than in the water up above. We're watching those animals breathe, and as they breathe, they take up the oxygen and they release the CO2, and the CO2 reacts with water to make an acid, and it drops the pH into the acid range. Such lowered pH levels could not only have an impact on existing corals, but they could also make it more difficult for new corals to settle on the reef and grow. Florida is home to the world's third largest barrier reef, but over the last several decades, coral cover has declined drastically. Two species, staghorn and elkhorn coral, have virtually disappeared and are now listed as threatened on the endangered species list. As once magnificent coral reefs have turned to rubble, other species, such as seaweed and sponges, have become more dominant. Sponges are animals and they uh, breathe like we do. Think of a barrel sponge as a hollow tree stump. They take water in through the bark and pump it up through the hollow. During that time, they're removing oxygen, but they're also doing other things. They are feeding. They convert those food particles into dissolved nutrient elements and carbon dioxide. The scientists are using harmless dye to see how fast and how far the sponges are pumping water as they filter feed. Well, we were out to measure how sponges are contributing to the change of chemistry in the water that covers the reef. And part of doing that is going to know how the water is moving around. And sponges are a big component of moving water 
both vertically on the reef and then just sort of recycling it down on the bottom. We also have instruments that are measuring pH at the same time, so we can see how the input of carbon dioxide, say from respiration of a sponge, is changing the pH down current from, from that sponge. So it looks like what sponges and other animals are doing down there really is changing the chemistry down near the bottom where everything is living. The researchers hope that the information they collect will help managers to determine if corals can survive and grow in these changing conditions. And if not, what needs to be done to make coral recruitment possible again. Florida's coral reefs hold great economic value for the state. Reef communities form specialized habitats that provide shelter, food, and breeding sites for many marine species. About 40% of marine fish spend at least part of their lives on reefs. Because of this, these habitats contribute greatly to the state's commercial and recreational fisheries. Fishing along the reefs combined with the tourism they attract bring several billion dollars to the state annually. Divers in the wet port, you have about four hours left on your dive. While the aquanauts spend most of their waking hours working, they do find some time to observe the abundant wildlife that lives around Aquarius. This is my first saturation mission. It was awesome. It's a big learning experience. It was hard to, to stay focused most times just because of everything else going on. I'm supposed to be out there working and to see the 200, 300 pound Jyth grouper, but I you know, stayed on task. After about two days, you tend to forget about the surface. When I was a kid, the big dream was to not have to come up. Well, here I am, don't have to come up. It's great. At the end of the 10 day mission, it's time for the scientists to return to the surface. But before they can do so safely, they need to go through decompression. We close the main doorway between the wet porch and the entry lock and shut that down. It's an O-ring sealed door, you know, pressurize it. Once the door is sealed tightly, the pressure inside the habitat is slowly reduced until it equals that of the surface. So we just open up a valve and start venting the gas. And uh, that changes the pressure inside slowly over time. There's a set rates, there's set you know, times, uh, so that your ascent rate is very, very controlled. This slow adjustment in pressure allows the aquanauts' bodies to safely shed the excess nitrogen that is built up in their bloodstream and tissues. The entire process is closely monitored from the watch desk. Aquarius, watch desk. Habitat is Nate. Nate, how's things going down there? Everybody's feeling great, tip top. What's for dinner? It looks like some people making some quesadillas and uh, trying to burn up the last of the salad so we don't have to leave it behind. All right. I will be talking with you. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you much. The decompression process lasts throughout the night for a total of 16 and a half hours. Then we hold them at, at zero feet for half an hour to make sure everybody still feels okay. Because the habitat is a chamber, and if someone suspects that they're bent at that point in time, it's easy to just treat them right there and then. Just recompress the habitat and then go through a whole process of decompression all over again. The next morning, it's another rough day when the boat support crew heads out to the habitat to pick up the aquanauts. But before they can exit Aquarius, they must re-pressurize the habitat first to be able to open the door to the wet porch. That usually lasts about, I don't know, 10 or so minutes. And then you open that doorway and you go back out to the wet porch. Okay, five divers in the wet porch. We have little pony bottles that they use with a regulator on instead of full dive gear. And they're mass and fins and that's it. They go out like that up an ascent line, a very slow ascent to the surface, and the, and the line they follow right to the back of the boat. Oh, it was great. It was a good mission. It was a good mission. We got a lot done. On the way back to shore, 
everyone is in good spirits. It's always fun to be on the frontier of uh, ocean science, and that's what this mission is about. Once they are back on land, the aquanauts are monitored for an additional 12 hours to ensure they are not suffering from decompression illness. All around, they've had a successful mission, and the scientists are excited about their findings. What we found was a very significant difference between the overlying water and the bottom. And what that really means is that the corals and other calcifying organisms that live there are actually not just subject to ocean acidification from the global change, they also have to deal with the local effects down in what we call the benthic boundary layer. A couple of centimeters off the bottom, pH was considerably dropped, especially at night when a lot of respiration was going on and there wasn't any CO2 uptake, CO2 causing ocean acidification. Another mission to continue studying ocean acidification at Aquarius is already planned for the following year. Ultimately, the scientists hope their research will aid managers in devising policies that help protect coral reefs. They also hope their work will help to educate the public about how human activities negatively impact one of Earth's great natural resources. We are the cause at this point of ocean acidification by increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's a great hope of mine that we could you know, change our behavior, find alternatives to things that are really causing damage to our environment. Because if we don't find solutions to these problems, it's coral reefs today, it's going to be humans down the road. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.